Strange Wills. Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William. And featuring Carlton Young and Howard Culver with an all-star Hollywood cast. Original music by Del Castillo. Dead men's wills are often strange. We cannot attempt to understand them or try to find the answers. We can but tell the story. This is Marvin Miller bringing you sales highlights of radio's newest and most sensational transcribed show, Strange Wills. What makes Strange Wills so outstanding? The answer is simple. These are strange stories of strange wills made under strange circumstances. They are unusual, different, exciting. Strange Wills is a show that cannot be typed. Suspense, romance, psychological drama, comedy, love, intrigue. Yes, every human emotion, every strange, unusual story behind man's last written declaration is brought forth and dramatized by Hollywood's greatest radio cast. Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William, Strange Wills has, in supporting roles, a host of names that have made radio history. Names such as Will Wright, John Brown, Carlton Young, Peggy Weber, Lurene Tuttle, Charlie Lung, Perry Ward, and Howard Culver. Strange Wills is written by Ken Crippine, lawyer and writer, who spent over ten years searching through probate files in courts all over the world for material that would guarantee the finest program ever to be heard on the air. Imagine a program that took ten years to build. Direction is under the very capable and brilliant producer, Robert Webster Light. All of this means only one thing. Strange Wills is radio fare that is different, exciting, and unusual in story content. There is nothing like it on the air. But now, let me substantiate these claims. Let's take romance. In the Strange Wills story, The Prince of Broadway... Harry McNeil, actor's agent, falls desperately in love with his young and beautiful protege, Judy Morrison. But in the code of the theater, career comes before love. Knowing that he can never put Judy in big time where she belongs, he wills her to his competitor and then joins the RAF. But Judy wouldn't stay put. She searched the battlefields of the world for Harry. And then finally one day in a little hospital just outside Munich... Well, let's listen to the scene. We have only about 60 patients. They are nationals of every country in the war. Are they all blind, Doctor? Most of them. But we have about 20 who are psychopathic cases. We are especially happy that you have come, Miss Morrison. You see, we have learned that musical therapy is very beneficial as a means of recovery. Mm -hmm. In many instances, our medical knowledge is of little value. Uh, well, if you are ready... You come too, John, won't you? Of course, if I can be of help. Uh, come this way, please. <laughs> Our piano survived the war, but I'm afraid it's badly out of tune. Uh, here we are. Many of them are seriously wounded as well as blind. Oh, John, how horrible. Frau Zimmerman will accompany you. You have your music? Oh, yes, Doctor, here it is. I'll walk around the room as I sing. You see, Doctor, I'm looking for a certain soldier. In fact, I've been looking now for almost four years. Uh -huh. He's listed as missing in action. Uh, what is his name? McNeil. Major Harry McNeil of the Royal Air Force. I am sorry, Miss Morrison, but our records do not show... Yes, I know. I've heard that from London to Berlin. But I'm still looking. When my dream boat comes home When my dreams no more will I will meet you and greet you, hold you closely, my own. Judy sang her heart out to those boys, just as she'd done month after month, year after year. She visited every bed, looking, hoping, praying. Many of the patients were swathed in bandages from head to foot. How she ever hoped to identify Harry was beyond understanding. But as she stood there, literally singing with eyes full of tears, she was a picture I'll never forget. 
The late afternoon sun came streaming into the room and formed an aura of light over her head. She looked like and was an angel of mercy. Like it? Well, who doesn't like love and romance? Now, let's switch over to psychological drama. It's the strange will story of Mad Concerto, the story of a girl who inherited $10 million from a wealthy admirer, if, a big if, too, if she would live alone the rest of her life and never marry. Warren William, as John Francis O'Connell, probate lawyer, visits the home of his client for the first time. It is then that he sees Nadia Winter. Let's go into the house with him. Come in, please, Mr. O'Connell. Mr. Walker is waiting for you. He's in his study on the second floor. Thank you very much. As I entered the door, I stopped. It was like a beautiful dream come true. I mean her, of course. She was sitting at a concert grand piano, completely engrossed in her music. She was exquisite, something out of a picture book. She had a wild, barbarous look, and her blonde hair seemed to keep tempo with the strange, savage music she was playing. As I passed her, she glanced up for just a fleeting moment, and I saw she had brown eyes, eyes that seemed to probe deeply into my soul. She held me with a long and tense look, and then... I lowered my eyes and followed the servant up the stairs. Who was this strange creature, this most beautiful, most sensuous of women? Even the scent of her exotic perfume reached out like tentacles of doom and encircled me. Unfortunately, I was to learn later. Wonder what happened? Well, how about asking your Telloway's representative to play the whole show? He'll do so gladly. Did you ever hear the story about the man who carved his last will on the back of a woman? He was a pirate, she a lady. After a terrific sea battle in which both ships were sunk, the pirate and the lady ended up on a desolate island. He wanted his estate in England to go to his little island in the Bahamas called Freeland, and the lady was willing. We won't tell you what happened on that lonely island. But in any event, John Francis O'Connell, the first... British barrister and king's agent accompanied the lady back to England in order to help her claim the pirate's inheritance. Suppose we listen to this thrilling and unforgettable scene from the lady and the pirate. My ultimate decision was clearly defined when I accompanied Lady Ruth Carroll back to London in order to help her in proving the last will and testament of Black Richard. We were summoned before the House of Peers. I presented her case. My lord, because of the mitigating circumstances which will be known to you, the last will and testament of the deceased can never be actually filed. But I have brought the sole beneficiary before this august body in order that each of you can personally examine the document. Lady Ruth Carroll, I ask you now to disrobe before the House of Peers. Oh, believe me, my lords, I do not show disrespect to either Lady Ruth Carroll or to you. Rest assured that only her back will be exposed. Are you ready, milady? Yes, Mr. O'Connell. Will you please walk up to the lords, milady, and let them examine your back? And with your permission, my lords, I shall read the words tattooed across her back. All to bearer. Signed, Sir George Pemberton, 1724. Many of you remember Sir George Pemberton. He sailed for the colonies ten years ago. Little was heard of him since, save only that he purchased an island in the Bahamas. But by fate or providence, as you will, Sir George Pemberton lived long enough to carve his last will and testament on the back of his own sister. Strange wills made by strange people. Yes, what entertainment, what a show. All the world loves a lover, and that's exactly why you will find the strange will story Seven Flights to Glory, one of the most beautiful, most poignant ever to be told on the air. Lucy Witherspoon, old, dominant, and willful, gave her son an only heir at law, 
the choice of inheriting the industrial empire she had created or the sum of $5,000 and a ticket to Paris. Bob, her son, wanted to be an artist more than anything in life, more even than the millions of dollars his mother offered. And so he took the ticket to Paris. And in so choosing, he lost the love of his fiancée. Well, what happened? Leave it to John Francis O'Connell. He played a fast game to mend two broken hearts. Here is the final heartwarming scene in Seven Flights to Glory. This is the last time I'm going to walk up seven flights for a long time to come. Seven flights to glory. A little bit tarnished just now, but I still love it. As soon as you've found a new model, you'll start over? Yes, but no more entanglements. From now on, it's art. Pure, unadulterated art. The next time I hear a girl say money, I'll well, ring... Well, here we are. Permit me to uh, open the door. Yeah. Uh, John... John, where did you, where did you find that model? What a figure, golden hair, wonderful proportions. Uh, hey, you, turn around. I, I want to see the face that comes with that perfect back. Uh, Catherine. Kay. Okay. Bob. Oh, Bob, darling. What on earth are you doing here? How in the... I moved to Paris, Bob. I took a job as a model. Mr. O'Connell offered it to me. You, you want a model? I... I can't... It's true, Bob, it's true. I want to be your model. And I'm going to live right here in the Latin Quarter, if you'll let me. Oh, I was so wrong. So wrong. Don't cry, darling. I was wrong, too. But come on, take off that robe and put on your dress and we'll find a place for you to live. I found one already. You have a place to live? Oh, I don't believe it. Where is it? It's, it's here, Bob. Right here in the studio. Here, here with all this paint and smells and canvases lying around. Uh -huh. See, I, I thought we could both live here very nicely. Both live here? Both of us? Yes, darling, both of us. This morning I stopped off and got us a marriage license. I thought maybe we'd still have time. Time. Time to start our glorious adventure? Oh, yes, darling, we have. A lifetime from this day on. Do you like horror? Do you like stories about the moors of Scotland, deadly moors covered with fog, and the eerie sounds of strange moor creatures? Add to that a murder. All of these ingredients put together spell 30 minutes of exciting, never-to-be-forgotten radio fare. This unusual strange will story, called Midnight on the Moor, is replete with dynamic intensity that will keep you on edge until the murderer is brought to bay. Let's listen to a short scene from Midnight on the Moor. See how easily you can be transplanted from wherever you are to the fog-swept moors of Scotland and a funeral. Dear brethren, we are all gathered here this night at the Castle McClanahan in the last tribute to the late departed Sir Walter McClanahan. In Mr. O'Connell's absence, I will take upon myself as Minister of the Gospel the duty of reading the will. According to the wishes of the late deceased Sir Walter McClanahan, the coffin is to be opened and his heirs at law will respectfully take seats around the coffin. Will you please wheel in the remains? Hey, right here in this room. Yeah, that's fine, lad. Thank you. And now then, will you please remove the cover? Sit it right over near the fire, please. With the five of you, please draw your chairs up to the foot of the coffin. Oh, how ghastly. Must we sit here and look into his dead face? It was his wish, Mr. Son. He was a peculiar one, my brother Walter was. Ever since that night when Moffat disappeared into the fog. Uncle Andrew, must you bring that? I'm sorry, lassie. I cannot help but think of that night. It made of him a madman. He always said that he would find the murderer of his son before he was laid to rest. This is his last chance. His last chance. Who said adventure? 
Well, Strange Wills has more than its quota. Let's examine the Strange Wills story, Emeralds Come High. Mix a grizzled old prospector and an emerald mine in the green hell of Columbia. Add the curvaceous and beautiful Patsy Bubbles Moran, Queen of Burlesque. Add to that a handsome young mining engineer. Sprinkle lightly with headhunters who capture Patsy and make her their queen. Drop into this concoction the rhythmic beat of jungle drums of a burlesque dance deep in the heart of the Colombian jungle. Shake well. And, uh, well, let's really give it a shake and see what comes out. Patsy Moran had disappeared as completely as though the jungle had swallowed her up. We searched everywhere, but not a single clue could we find. Steve, Peter, and I were forced to the conclusion that she'd been captured by the headhunters. As soon as the storm abated, we decided to increase the perimeter of our search. By twos, we spread out in an ever-widening circle. A little later... Bossman! Bossman, come! That's Tulu. That's Tulu. He must have found something. Let's hurry. Coming, Tulu. See, Bossman? One tree. Tulu find hair. Red hair. That belongs to Patsy, all right. Now let's look around and try to find some more. We can trail her right to their village if we're lucky. Here's another one over here. Looks as though Patsy is deliberately letting her hair get caught in the underbrush. She's showing us the way. Drums beat closer. We're getting closer to their encampment now. Be careful where you step. We can't let them hear us. Shh. Look. Over here between these bushes. That's the village, all right. What's going on? I can't see. Looks like they're having their ceremonial dance. All of the Hibaro tribe are sitting in a semicircle. Someone must be dancing. See how they keep swaying to the throb of the drums? That's their dance of victory. I hope that doesn't I don't think we're too late. They all dance around a new head. Now only one is dancing. I'll go up closer. Wait here. Hey, crawl over here. We can see everything. One at a time. You go first, John. Take a look, John. There's a sight to remember. Shades of Minsky. It's Patsy, and she's dancing. What a dance, Broadway. Never saw anything like that. We've got to let her know we're here. Wait. With all these birds raising bedlam around us, I think I can do it. What are you going to do? I'll give her the wolf whistle. <laughs> She'll recognize that. She didn't hear you. Do it again. She heard it. Hey, she's giving us a message. Heard you, heard you. Dancing to save my head. They want to make me their queen. Come back tonight. Same place. See you. rest of that one, too. <laughs> Strange wills. All right, let's admit it. Have you heard anything on the air as versatile, as strikingly different? But listen, we're coming up with thrills and chills. In this next Strange Will chapter, entitled Margin for Love, Tim Ryan is scheduled to die in the electric chair for a murder of which he is innocent. John Francis O'Connell, admirably played by Warren William, learns of his innocence just 30 minutes before the switch is to be thrown at the state prison. He is attempting to reach the governor to tell him of the news. It is 30 minutes to midnight, and a storm is raging over the state. Let's listen to this most thrilling scene from Margin for Love. Busy signal. Why, I haven't even reached the operator. 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 Number, please. Operator, listen to me. This is John Francis O'Connell, attorney at law. Put in a long-distance call to the governor's residence for me. A man is scheduled to die in 17 minutes. One moment, please. I'll connect you with long distance. Oh, all right. Long distance. Long distance. This is John O'Connell, attorney at law. I want to place a call, an emergency call, to the governor's residence. A man's life I'm is... sorry, sir, but there'll be a slight delay. 
All of the circuits are busy. Oh, hang the circuits. I tell you, a man's life is in danger. A man is to die at midnight. I tell you... One moment, please. I'll connect you with my supervisor. Oh, hang the supervisor. I want the governor's mansion. This is the supervisor speaking. Supervisor, listen. In just nine minutes, a man is scheduled to die in the electric chair. I have evidence to save him. I'm sorry, sir. I can't make out what you're saying. Supervisor, supervisor, don't leave the line. I want the governor. The governor. Do you understand me? Get me the governor. One moment, please. I'll try and connect you. Shall I frighten you? Only five minutes to midnight. Only five minutes. No, I'll, I'll have him in a moment. Well, for those who want to know what happened... Contact your Telaways representative or write direct to Telaways Radio Productions of Hollywood. It's a smash ending unsurpassed in modern radio drama and loaded from start to finish with suspense. Uh, did I hear a quiet, well-modulated voice say, give me music? Well, good, I wholeheartedly agree. Let's take out the strange will show called Emily. We will hear the music of the masters. Emily is the story of a violin a violin made by that great craftsman, Antonio Stradivari, way back in 1732. Emily is the life story of that violin, the only violin that the great master named after a girl, the girl he deeply loved and never married because she became a nun. What happened to Emily down through the centuries is a classic of modern storytelling, how she grew in tone and stature, how she laughed with the gypsies and cried under a dictator, makes one of the most beautiful stories of all times. Let's listen for a few minutes to a scene of this great radio show. Emily has been stolen by the gypsies. These were glorious days for Emily, and from the enchanted woodlands of Italy she traveled north through the Balkans up through the forests of Russia, ever singing, ever living, ever growing. At night under the moon, the gypsies would gather round their campfires and sing their ancient songs of Romany. Emily pulsed with warmth and feeling. She must have loved the gypsies, and they loved her. For almost 30 years, she traveled from the steppes of Russia to the sunny provincial towns of Spain. One day, the little gypsy band entered Vienna. As was their custom, they wandered through the city singing songs, telling fortunes, and, of course, playing Emily. As they played their wild gypsy music, a man opened his window in the olden house and looked down into the street. Hey, the gypsies! Who gives a Paganini competition? Who owns that violin? It belongs to us, Maestro Paganini. To us, the gypsies of Romani. I want to look at it. Bring it up, please, to Suite 200. But we are not allowed to enter the public buildings, Maestro. We are gypsies. It is against the law. <laughs> when a Paganini says to enter, you enter. With a violin such as you have, you can storm the very gates of paradise. Come in, I say. <laughs> Come in, gypsy girl. Come in. Thank you. Thank you, Maestro Paganini. Hey, but where are the others? I invited them all. Well, they will wait for me outside. We gypsies are not worthy of the invitation of the great maestro. Ah, you gypsies. <laughs> what the simple children you are. You cry and laugh. <laughs> Much as the children do. Ah. <sighs> But I envy you. I, Maestro Paganini, envy you with my whole heart. Envy us gypsies? Oh, the Maestro is making fun. No, no, no. No, I speak what is in my heart. I envy you gypsies because you alone know the wonderment of nature. You alone witness the miracles of God. And you alone have the feel of life. Oh, 
Give me the violin, please. I, I would look at it. Oh, yes, yes. Here it is, maestro. Oh. Let us walk over here to the window. The light is much better. Oh, the work of the ship is burned. Oh, wait. Wait, let me look inside. There, I see the signature. I knew when I heard that tone I was not a mistake. Antonio Stradarius. 1732. Emily. 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 So this is the violin that the whole world has been searching for. This is Emily. It's the greatest of all creations. Emily? Emily, I, I do not understand. This is the one violin Stradivarius and named after the girl. They say she was his boy with a sweetheart before she came a nun. He never forgot. And his name is a violin, after all. And to think it belongs to us, the gypsies. Ah, but Maestro Paganini, Emily has been happy with us. She sings just as we do and cries, and she dances our gypsy dances, just as though she was born one of us. May I play? Oh, Maestro, that would make all of us happy. Emily played by the great Paganini. <laughs> Divine. I, I cannot live without. I offer 1,000 lira. 1,000 lira? Oh, no, maestro. 2,003? No, maestro Paganini. Oh, no. Oh, how much then? The name of the prize. How much to make Emily mine? I must have. You shall not leave this room until we strike a bar. Gypsies are strange people, maestro. My father instructed me to tell you that if you love the violin, then it is to be yours. For what the price, Gypsy Girl? The price is this. That you shall play one of our beloved songs of Rome and me for us now. Look, look out at the window. You see? They stand on the street below, waiting for you to play. Yes. There they stand. All of them. Looking up here. You see now, Gypsy Girl, why? What I meant when I said it, you gypsies were God's most beloved children. If, if I cry a little, pay no attention. I'm a silly, sentimental fool. You gypsies are below. You shall have your song of Romany and more. You shall have the eternal love of the great Paganini. I vow you this before the blessed mother. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what do you think of Strange Wills as America's top dramatic radio show? There isn't any type of client in cities large or small who wouldn't benefit from buying this exceptionally beautiful show. And as for listening audience, I promise you, once a listener, always a listener. For further information about Strange Wills, write or wire direct to Telaway's Radio Productions, Incorporated. 8949 Sunset Boulevard, Hollywood 46, California, or telephone Crestview 67238. Strange Wills may still be available for your market. I can only add that to assure yourself of Strange Wills, wire or write today. This is Marvin Miller saying, what is more strange, more fascinating, more exciting than the true stories of strange wills made by strange people. 
Strange Wills. Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William. And featuring Carlton Young and Howard Culver with an all star Hollywood cast. Original music by Del Castillo. Dead men's wills are often strange. We cannot attempt to understand them or try to find the answers. We can but tell the story. This is a Telaways feature. Produced 